In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. So nice to be with you here, episode 111. It's Bilbo Baggins' uh, Veracity Hill episode, his 111th birthday. <laughs> uh, we've got a great program for you today. Uh, we're talking about Hitler's religion, um, and uh, there's some confusion surrounding that by many people. Um, he seems to have invoked God's name for various things, um, and uh, some people think he was a Christian, but he really obviously didn't do many Christian things following in the way of Jesus. So how should we uh, understand his beliefs? Uh, and so um, before we get to that, though, we've got a few announcements on today's program. Uh, first, September 28 and 29, uh, the Defenders Conference inches closer and closer week by week as some of us here at Defenders uh, Media are preparing for the event. We've got these great hand cards that uh, came in uh, that uh, front and back, uh, really awesome. Here's the back with the different speakers you can see. It's going to be an awesome opportunity, and it, you can see there, text uh, Genocide to 555888 to learn more. Uh, I was uh, speaking to someone uh, who um, brought up the event with someone at their church, and they thought, oh, you know, well, there's 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 blood on the, the text, and, you know, that's, that's something that we can't really show people. Well, well, wait a second. It's there in the scriptures where Yahweh commands the Israelites to kill the women and the children. So how should we understand that command? Uh, and evangelicals have different perspectives on interpreting those passages. So this event is going to be an awesome event. And I want to encourage uh, you to come into Chicago to uh, attend this uh, Friday night, Saturday event. Uh, we've got uh, a family coming from Oklahoma, believe it or not, for this event. Uh, that's the farthest that I've heard. And actually a couple from Virginia also coming. I'd have to check the map to see which one's further from Chicago. So if you're thinking about spending a weekend in Chicago, this is a great opportunity to do that. And if you want to learn more, you can go to the defendersconference.com uh, website. You can learn about the speakers, the breakout sessions, and even register for the event. Uh, I want to make a special uh, thank you here. Uh, we uh, have a new video camera. Uh, uh, so I want to thank Christ Church of Oak Brook, the Domestic Missions uh, Committee, uh, for their uh, wonderful gift to Defenders Media, uh, allowed us to uh, purchase a uh, Black Magic ursa broadcast camera so if you've noticed if you are noticing an improved quality in the footage here uh a special thank you to christ church of oak brook for their generosity and if you'd like to learn how you can uh, contribute to the production here at veracity hill and for other defenders media uses uh, you can donate at our website veracityhill.com slash patron or defendersmedia.com slash uh, slash donate we'd love to get your uh, recurring support to help our ministry grow all right, so uh, today we're talking about Hitler's religion, and uh, in order to uh, help uh, speak uh, in an educated manner on these issues, uh, we've invited Dr. Richard Weikart, who is a uh, professor of history at the at California State University, Stanislaus. And uh, Richard, thank you so much for joining us on our program today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Kurt. Uh, great. Uh, and so um, before we get talking about uh, Hitler's religion... Um, I would like to have you give us a, a background of sort of who Hitler was. I mean, sort of square one. Let's imagine that you're speaking to someone who's never heard of Hitler. How would you describe, <laughs> in a brief as possible, how would you describe who he was and the effect on um, Western civilization that he had? Well, Hitler, of course, was the dictator of Germany from 1933 to 1945, and he's the one who... Uh, was one of the major causes of World War II. So he had a profound impact in that respect on world history, but also then in his antagonism toward the Jews, he was going to initiate the Holocaust, killing about six, six million Jews during the time of World War II. So he had an, a huge impact on 
the middle part of the 20th century and a very deadly impact, in fact, uh, not only killing Jews, but also killing people with disabilities uh, by the tens of thousands. In fact, about 200,000 Germans, mm. and, and you don't even know the exact number for people in occupied territories. Mm. Uh, and then there also we have all the Slavs he killed, the Soviet POWs, millions of Soviet POWs were killed. So we don't know what the exact death toll was, but it was uh, uh, well above 10 million people killed. And that doesn't even include the military uh, the, combat figures, which would uh, boost the figure by another uh, several tens of millions. Mm, mm. And uh, now the reason why I bring this up is um, I found an article, and, and maybe I can find it. Uh, there was some study conducted. I'm not sure if it was academic or popular, but many people, it was something like 33% of people didn't know what the Holocaust was. Uh, I'll have to look that up here while we're conducting our interview. Four, here it is. CBS News, four in ten millennials don't know six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. Forty <laughs> yeah. percent of millennials. Uh, wow, that's just astounding. So that's why I sort of gave you this very basic upfront question. Many of us who uh, are interested more in theology and politics and uh, issues in society and history um, you know, are, are very familiar with, with this, but sadly there are some people out there that I don't know what it is, but it's not on their radar or hasn't been on their historical radar. So uh, let's, um, before even talking about the way he utilized religion in like his public speeches and whatnot, and, and we're, we're, we want to get into those issues, who was he uh, in terms of his, his upbringing? You know, was he raised in a Christian church? Uh, what sort of beliefs did he have as a child? Um, maybe we can start from there and, and work our way chronologically. Yeah. He was, raised, he was baptized as a Catholic in Austria, which was overwhelmingly Catholic. His mother was fairly pious and devout. His father, however, was uh, probably would be best described as a free thinker, that is, someone who was antagonistic toward the Catholic Church, which was not an uncommon position mm. for a lot of people to be taking at the time. Uh, Hitler, by the time he got to his confirmation age, uh, there's one witness who suggested that he uh, even though he went through it, he did go through his confirmation in Catholicism. Uh, one of his relatives claimed that he was rather contemptuous of the Catholic Church already at that time and and sort of scoffing at it. Once he reached his teenage years uh, and left home, uh, he never attended church with the few exceptions during his adult life for a few marriages and funerals and things like that. But he never attended Mass mm. uh, of the Catholic Church uh, as a young man, once he left home and moved to Vienna in 1907, when he was 18, he moved to Vienna. And from that point on, there's no evidence that he uh, had any interest in Catholicism. And uh, Brigitte Hamann, who's done one of the best studies of Hitler's time in Vienna, it's just called Hitler's Vienna. Uh, she argues that he was very anti-clerical already by that time. And that the only evidence we have from that time suggests that he was already anti-religious. Mm. Um, so certainly by his young adult uh, age when he left home, he was a, what we what we might call a nominal Catholic. Um, did he even affiliate with the name? Did he even take the name, or did he just become anti-religious? Well, the, this is tricky in, in when you're talking about a country where you have a state church. I mean, we're, we we yeah. don't understand this quite in the United States. Yeah, but right. In, in Germany and Austria, both places, there's a state church. So you are officially a member until you go down to the city hall and withdraw from the church, but you have to pay a fee <laughs> to get out of the church, right? So, so a lot of people, even though they didn't have any uh, any uh, heartfelt affiliation with the church, yeah. just never bothered to go down to City Hall and withdraw for uh, one reason or another. And Hitler, once he became a politician, uh, didn't want to withdraw because he thought that would be bad PR mm. uh, for him. So, no, Hitler never officially withdrew from the Catholic Church. So, officially, he was a Catholic till the day that he died. <laughs> and and so, part of uh, getting through the muddy waters here on this issue is in recognizing that sometimes there are these labels, and these labels may not apply in substance. Uh, that is, it's a name only, it's nominal. So, when some people, um, you know, we have... People have these discussions on ethics and uh, apologetics, and so they bring up the Nazis. And so some people say, oh, well, Hitler was a Christian. We need to ask ourselves, okay, well, what, what do you mean when you're using that term? Uh, it, it's, it's a label. How are you using the label? 
did he self-identify as that? Well, maybe not even devotedly, but at least on the, the record books, uh, he was a Catholic. Um, but that doesn't really mean very much in substance. Um, and it doesn't mean he believed in Catholic teachings and doctrines yeah. and practices. He obviously he didn't practice Catholicism, so he was in mortal sin, essentially. <laughs> you know, the Catholic Church would have seen him as being in mortal sin because he never went to Mass. He never went to confession. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I mentioned that he went to some funerals and, and uh, weddings. That after one of the funerals that he went to in the mid-1930s, in Berlin, Goebbels recorded in his diary that Hitler came back just scoffing at what he had just the funeral mass that he'd just been to. Uh, so uh, Hitler uh, had a lot of contempt for Catholicism and its doctrines. Mm. This comes a lot in his private speeches, monologues that he gave during World War II, especially. Goebbels records this in his diary. Rosenberg records this in his diaries. Their conversations with Hitler, and, and because Hitler did talk a lot about religion, interestingly, if you look at his monologues, if you look at yeah. the, what his uh, colleagues have to say. But he talked a lot about religion, but typically it was uh, anti-Catholicism, anti-Christian in uh, his uh, speech. Mm, mm. Uh, we've got uh, some folks listening in today. Uh, we've got uh, John here. He writes, according to historian Alan Bullock, Hitler was anti-religious, and if not atheist, then some form of non-religious belief. Uh, in a providence. Um, Hitler did incorporate the religious language uh, in his speeches. Um, some might call it a sort of civil religion. You know, many politicians will invoke, uh, you know, God or other concepts, religious concepts, in order to um, appear as if you're one of the people. Right. Um, and so certainly Hitler does this. But it, he even goes further than that, and and there becomes, as he rises to power, there becomes this cult-like mentality. Um, give give us some details um, about the the cult-like things that were associated with the marketing and messaging, the confessions people created uh, that included him. It's really a fascinating thing for many of us of Americans, where we have a different political structure than say what they. Well, they they had a democracy, but, I mean, it began to change. Um, tell us more about that. Yeah, well, actually, some historians have actually argued that Nazism was what they call a political religion because of the way that it tried to incorporate rites and ceremonies and other kinds of things to sort of replace uh, Christianity in certain kinds of ways. And Hitler, in that context, becomes sort of a messiah figure. Uh, and there were some ways when this is, this is fairly overt, uh, the, the League of German Women, uh, the League of German Girls, rather, uh, for example, uh, formulated a uh, a prayer, of, if you can call it that, that was modeled on the Lord's Prayer, but it was in honor of Hitler, and it was speaking to Hitler as being their Führer. Huh. And, uh, Dein, and the second line of it, you know, which in the, the Lord's Prayer would be, Thy kingdom come, uh, is Dein Reich komme. And of course, it's the <laughs> Dritte, das Dritte Reich, uh, the, the German words, the Third Reich. Uh, Reich means kingdom. Uh, so they're talking about uh, instead of instead of God's kingdom coming, the Third Reich, the Third yeah. Kingdom, is supposed to to come. So there were lots of ways, and and Hitler, the most interesting way that I found that Hitler sort of played upon this, uh, interestingly, is when he talked about Jesus, and Hitler did actually uh, speak highly and positively about Jesus, but he saw Jesus as being a non-Jew. He said Jesus was an Aryan, and he was an Aryan <laughs> fighter. And Hitler's favorite story of Jesus was when Jesus went into the temple and drove out the money-grubbing Jews, right? The, these greedy Jews. With a whip. And so that yeah. plays into Hitler's ideas of the Jewish stereotypes and, and such. So, so Hitler thought highly about Jesus, but in one place, he made this comment about how that Hitler was going to fulfill what Jesus had failed to do. And Jesus had failed to do it because Jesus had died. And Hitler didn't believe in the resurrection. So Hitler thought that Jesus had died at the hands of the Jews— and therefore, he'd failed, essentially. Wow. And Hitler was going to come along and was going to succeed by destroying the Jews. And there were many people that viewed Hitler as a messiah-like figure. Um, oh, yeah, clearly. Yeah, and he, and he was he was going to be the savior. Um, and some compared Hitler or, or called him a you know half plebeian, half god. Um, yeah, that was Goebbels. That was Goebbels' comment. Yes. Yeah, and and just you know give him this status of deity. Uh, a, a Herculean figure, if you will, <laughs> in yeah. their minds. 
Quite. In fact, Ian Kershaw, who's Ian Kershaw, who's the the has one of the best biographies of Hitler. It's a massive two volume, eighteen hundred page or so biography of Hitler. He argues that he he wrote a book called The Hitler Myth, and in that book he argues that Hitler, up until about nineteen twenty three or so, uh, saw himself as sort of a, a John the Baptist figure, sort mm. of a forerunner for some coming Messiah of some <laughs> sorts. But about 1923 or so, Hitler began to take on himself the aura of the Messiah himself. And sort of there was a shift in his mm. thinking about his own role to where he sort of became the, the Messiah figure in his own view and then portrayed that to the public. Who, who wouldn't want to be a Messiah instead of John the Baptist? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty wild. Um, so there are a question for you. There are. Many books out there on Hitler, his biography, uh, even some uh, about his religious beliefs. So what got you interested to explore uh, this topic and, um, and and feel like you were making a contribution here? And as we do that, let me put this up here. Here's Hitler's religion, the twisted beliefs that drove the Third Reich. Uh, and so um, you can check that out. We'll be sure to put a link to at our uh, website. Um, so what got you interested in yeah. and putting forth a, a, a publication like this? Well, I sort of got interested in a roundabout way because when I was doing my doctoral dissertation, which was on the reception of Darwinism by the German socialists, which has nothing to do with the Third Reich or the Nazi period, I got interested in the way that some of the Darwinists in the late 19th century had been using evolutionary ethics as a way of replacing Judeo-Christian ethics mm. or any other kind of ethics for that matter, Kantian or other kind of ethics. Yeah. And so I decided to do a research project uh, on evolutionary ethics in late 19th century Germany. And I didn't wasn't thinking of, of Hitler or the Nazis at that point. But as I began investigating, I started finding out that the people that believed in evolutionary ethics by the late 19th, uh, especially the 1890s and early 1900s, largely were people who also believed in eugenics, the idea that we need to uh, improve human heredity by controlling mm. reproduction. They were people who were embracing euthanasia. They were people who were embracing scientific racism. And I thought, this does sound a lot like Nazi ideology. So I, po I thought to myself, okay – does this then apply? Was Hitler, did Hitler believe in evolutionary ethics? And of course, Hitler doesn't use the term evolutionary ethics himself, but as I began investigating his ideology, I discovered that, yeah, I mean, basically the ideas he was putting forward were social Darwinist ideas that embrace the idea that uh, evolution produces morality in uh, humans, that, that, her that morality is hereditarily ingrained, and that we can uh, help uh, the evolutionary process along, and that's sort of what, what is moral is helping the evolutionary process along. So, I, to make a long story short, then, I wrote the book called From Darwin to Hitler, Evolutionary Ethics, Eugenics, and Racism in Germany. That came out in 2004. The last chapter of that was on Hitler. The rest of it was on or before World War I, was pre-World War I uh, German ideologies. Mm -hmm. uh, I met a lot of biologists and social thinkers and such. The chapter on uh, Hitler, though, I expanded into a full-length work in 2009 called Hitler's Ethic, The Nazi Pursuit of Evolutionary Progress. And so that laid out the way that Hitler embraced evolutionary ethics and social Darwinism and in a variety of fields, eugenics, euthanasia, militarism, and such, and showed that it really was a central feature of his ideology. It wasn't just some tangential uh, thing. It sort of uh, it had uh, its tentacles in a lot of different areas. Uh, so when I wrote, as I was writing that book or, and researching that book, I got uh, Richard Steichman Gall at Kent State University put out a book called The Holy Reich, Nazi conceptions of Christianity. And Steichmann Gall's book uh, argues that Nazis were a lot closer to Christianity than most historians heretofore had uh, argued. And so I, I became very, in, that's one of the things that got me interested in thinking about this particular issue because I didn't think Steichmann Gall's, uh, Steichmann Gall's thesis was pretty controversial. Most historians didn't really embrace it. Uh, and so I, I got interested in looking at that particular issue, and in some of my work is arguing against Steichmann Gall's position. Yeah, nice, nice. And in but, the I also, but I also, as I, as I got, let me say more too. As I got into the issue, though, too, I mean, I started recognizing that sort of in the popular sphere, there's just all sorts of misconceptions about Hitler's religious views. A lot of atheists and agnostics claim that Hitler was a Christian. A lot of Christians claim that he was an atheist. Yeah. Uh, other. Yeah. People claim he was an occultist. You know, you got these sort of three main views that are out there in the popular sphere. A lot of scholars don't buy into those those uh, ideas, but there's a lot of popular misconceptions like that. And so my book argues against all three of those ideas. Yeah, nice. And I'm hoping we'll get a chance um, 
to explore some of those ideas. And, and you put forth an interesting theory, uh, at least from someone who hasn't studied the topic, that he was, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, just from checking this out, that, that he viewed nature as God. You've kind of categorized right. it that way, a, a, a pantheistic view. Um, and, of course, he wouldn't use that terminology, but, you know, when, when the rubber hits the road, what, what do you label it? What do you, you know, call his view? Um, and that's, you know, and that's something different than the popular um, options out there, like you said. Um, yeah. And I'm not the first person who suggested this. I mean, Rich, uh, Robert Poise, who was a professor of history at uh, University of Colorado and wrote a book about Nazi nature religion, uh, he also suggested that the Nazis were largely pantheists. He wasn't looking just at Hitler. But he was looking at Himmler and others in the, in the SS and such. And he argued that the Nazis were pantheistic as well. So I'm not the, it's not like I'm, I'm totally the first person to, to bring forward this idea. But I'm the first person that sort of applied this to Hitler in a thoroughgoing fashion and looked at it uh, in, in that way. Uh, there's a lot of indications that Hitler did uh, deify nature. In Mein Kampf, for example, uh, there's some in very interesting passages there. One of the most famous passages from Mein Kampf, interestingly, is the passage where Hitler says that by uh, persecuting the Jews, I am doing the work of the Lord. And that is used so often to sort of place Hitler in sort of this Christian context, to see Hitler as, you know, as a Christian persecuting the Jews and such. But if you look at the context, there's a very interesting sentence that comes right above it. And the whole context is very interesting because the context he's talking about the aristocratic laws of nature and how they uh, are uh, constraining uh, things. And then mm -hmm. just before this sentence where he says about uh, by persecuting the Jews, I'm doing the work of the Lord. He says that eternal nature avenges uh, any transgression of its commands. And so he calls nature eternal, which is very interesting, because if you're a theist, you don't believe that nature is eternal. A theist believes that God created nature, uh, and so it had a beginning, it had a start. So Hitler believed that nature was eternal. That's one clue. That doesn't tell you for sure that he's a pantheist, right. but that's a little clue there. But he also talks about nature having commands. Nature avenges its commands. Uh, and so it, the, the infringement of its commands. So Hitler speaks about nature in that way. And very interestingly, if you look at the various translations of Mein Kampf, and there are about four or five translations of Mein Kampf that were done back in the 30s, uh, you find out that most of the translators, in fact, I think all of the translators, actually capitalize nature uh, in those contexts. Huh. So the translators recognized that he was deifying or at least personifying nature in those contexts as well. Now, Hitler, of course, would have, we don't know if Hitler would have gone with that stylistic convention because the, the Germans always capitalize nature. It's a noun. The Germans capitalize all nouns. So Hitler did capitalize nature, but that doesn't mean him a whole lot. Mm. But the translators at least recognized that Hitler was doing something with nature there that was not just speaking about it as an inanimate object. Yeah. Now, you talked about um, uh, Darwinism, uh, how that had an influence. So what, what, were his, um, what were the influences over his religious beliefs? Yeah, well, interestingly, when Hitler in his monologues reflects back, and we're not exactly sure how <laughs> up and up this is, Hitler a lot of times lied about his earlier upbringing, but in his monologues, he actually does talk about when he was at school, how in his religion classes, which were mandated by the state, this is state run, you know, these are state uh, churches uh, in Austria and also in Germany at the time. So they had mandated religion classes. Uh, and Hitler mentioned how during his religion class, he would be taught something different than in his science class. In his science classes, he was being taught Darwinian evolution. In his religion classes, he was being taught creation and such. So uh, Hitler mentions this and clearly takes the side of Darwinism against uh, his Catholic teachings that he'd had in his religion classes mm. uh, there and uses this as an opportunity. This was in, I think, I think it was in October 1941, if I recall correctly, uh, in his monologue, uh, where he used this as an opportunity to bash Catholicism and such in his religious upbringing that he'd had, but he definitely saw uh, Darwinian evolution as being a very important component of his uh, worldview and ideology. And again, I think that fits in with this pantheistic framework because he sees uh, Darwinis, Darwinism as being the origins of morality, and so he sees uh, morality is being tied in with nature, and so morality doesn't come from God, morality comes from nature. Mm. It's interesting because there are some atheists today that still take that route. They still take that line of reasoning and uh, that our morals just um, have evolved from the evolutionary process. 
And but when you bring up, well, hey, how's that different from Nazism? They say, oh, well, no, 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 we've we've learned from that. You know, it doesn't seem like there's still that intellectual grounding for them to say that. I mean, I always pose this hypothetical. Well, what if Hitler had won? And uh, and some people say, oh, that was that would have been impossible given all the factors. But I think the uh, there's an Amazon Prime show that I haven't watched yet called The Man in the High Castle. And it presents this, you know, fictional reality. What if the Nazis had won? Um, where would that that lead? So very fascinating um all right let's and, and, and if, if you look at a people a person who did win like genghis khan i mean genghis khan had a lot of the same uh committed a lot of atrocities like hitler did mm. uh, massacred you know multitudes of people uh he even made a statement at one point that he he en- enjoyed it brought him great joy to kill his enemies to rape their wives to you know destroy their cities and such he did win and he actually put uh, you know, he has uh, incredible, uh, you know, I don't know what the number of his descendants are around today, but they're in the probably hun- maybe hundreds of millions of people who are his descendants uh, today. So he put a lot of, uh, uh, and he, he had lots of uh, uh, people put in the gene pool. So he did win in the evolutionary sense. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, the question is, you know, what's wrong with what Genghis Khan did? And people who think that morality simply evolved, I don't think have any way of saying, well, he evolved too. So I mean, well, how is... How is evolving to be kindly and gentle, how is that better than evolving to be brutal and a massacre? Uh, and I don't think uh, atheists have a good answer for that. Yeah, right, right. Um, okay, we've got a question here, uh, and then after this question, we'll head to a break. Uh, it comes from Ted, uh, who's listening in. He writes, is Professor Weikart familiar with Richard Weaver's 1948 book, Ideas Have Consequences? What are his thoughts on it, and does he agree with Weaver's thesis that the philosophy of 14th century nominalism was a major component which led to Hitler's rise to power in Weimar, Germany. Very academic question here. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, I do know about Weaver's work, Ideas Have Consequences, and obviously as an intellectual story myself, I certainly believe that the ideas have consequences, and that's some of the, what I'm trying to uh, spin out uh, in my work uh, about Hitler's ethic and Hitler's religion uh, and such. You know, um, I haven't done enough in-depth study on the impacts of nominalism. I'm a little skeptical, though, of that uh, claim that's made. A lot of times that claim gets made, in fact, uh, and uh, by Catholic scholars who want to tag the Protestants as being the heirs of nominalism. And so they sort of see the trajectory as going from nominalism to Protestantism and then ultimately in the 20th century to Hitler and such. I don't really think that uh, works very effectively in terms of a, a intellectual lineage uh, in thinking about uh, Hitler. Again, Hitler came from a Catholic context. Anyway, I don't see any I don't see any way of suggesting that Hitler himself was influenced by nominalism. So again, I am kind of skeptical of the way that would work itself out. Mm, Nice. Great. Thank you. Um, All right. Well, we're going to go to a break here, but when we come back, we're going to talk about um, Hitler's religion and how uh, some uh, historians are uh, misguided, uh, perhaps. Well, certainly the popular ideas here that uh, Hitler was a Christian or that he was an occultist or that he was an atheist and that the the truth is um, requires a little bit more digging than that. And on today's program, we've got uh, Dr. Richard Weikart. So stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Have you heard of the Google Ad Grant for nonprofits? 501c3 nonprofit organizations can receive $10,000 per month in online advertising credit from Google, empowering you to share your message with the world. At Defenders Media, we partnered with Nonprofit Megaphone, an agency focused solely on Google grant acquisition and management. They got us approved for the grant and now manage ad campaigns, bringing hundreds of new people to our websites each month. If you are eligible, 
nonprofit megaphone will acquire and manage the grant for you for a month for free to see if they can help you too. Visit nonprofitmegaphone.com to learn more. Thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. If you'd like to learn how you can become a sponsor, go to our website, veracityhill.com, and click on that patron tab. And there are some different levels and options. We would love to get your support if you want to help advertise your business, your organization, or your ministry. Uh, we'd love to partner with you and help promote uh, what you're doing as well. On today's program, we're talking about Hitler's religion. And before we get uh, back to that, we have this... Uh, Wonderful segment of the show that we call Rapid Questions. And uh, Dr. Weichart, I, I didn't tell you about this segment, did I? And that was uh, intentional. This is a fun part of the, the program where we just ask qu um, quick questions and we're looking for uh, sort of genuine answers. Uh, so we'll see how many you can um, get through here. I'll get the game clock going. And um, after I start it, I'll read the first question. So are you ready? Sure. Okay, here we go. What is your clothing store of choice? <laughs> I don't even know. Goodwill, probably. <laughs> All right, Taco Bell or KFC? Ta that? Taco Bell or KFC? Uh, Taco Bell. Uh, what's your most hated sports franchise? I don't follow sports, so... <laughs> no problem. What is your spouse's favorite holiday? Thanksgiving, probably. Who's one person you'd like to have dinner with to discuss a topic you disagree on? Uh, maybe Richard Dawkins. That's a that's a popular one. Uh, pick a fictional <laughs> pick a fictional character you'd like to meet. Ah, oh, uh, fictional character. Um, not much of a fiction guy. No, I don't read a lot of fiction, actually. Uh, some, but not a lot. Um, yeah. No worries. You can pass. Uh, last question here. Do you drink Dr. Pepper? Mm, hardly ever. I hardly ever drink pop. Oh, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I do drink I like Dr. Pepper, but I don't drink pop very often. <laughs> sure. Yeah, okay. All right, good. I'll let you pass with that one. <laughs> well, thank you for playing that round of rapid questions. So let me ask you this. Goodwill, that's your favorite clothing store of choice. <laughs> <laughs> there are some good deals there i mean what's that there are some good deals to be found at goodwill that's for sure uh, it's you know my wife and i like to swing in and see you never know what you might find there so one one's man one man's donation is another man's treasure let's put it that way great great um okay so uh we're talking about hitler's religion uh on the program uh before we get to that i wanted to share a few links here um, to Apologetics 315, which is uh, one of our ministries uh, that we uh, manage here. And Chris, if you can put that up for uh, viewers here, you can see here uh, our weekly bonus links. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, once a week, we put up these bonus links, a variety of links here on um, Kindle deals or just articles, videos. Um, this week, we've got some videos by reasons.org. Um, ChristianThinkTank.com, Bible Sprout, Clear Lens, um, some great deals on, on Kindle books, Craig Keener, J. Warner Wallace, Greg Kokel. So I want to encourage you to go and check that out. Just go to Apologetics315.com and it's right there. We, we post those links Friday night, so it's fresh, top of the page. So check that out if you can. Okay, um, back to uh, the topic for today's program. Uh, Confusion surrounds uh, what exactly Hitler believed about his religious views. Some people think um, uh, he certainly invoked religious themes and motifs in his speeches, uh, So, and he grew up Catholic, so maybe he was a Christian. Uh, but again, he didn't really do Christ-like things. Uh, David Floyd comments here, uh, too. He makes that uh, distinction. David, thanks for watching on the, the program. Um, John's tuning in. I started to watch The Man in the High Castle, he writes. Um, some people believe that Hitler was an atheist, uh, but it's not quite so clear-cut. He didn't believe God did not exist, and so the truth is a bit um, requires some digging to uncover. And so on today's program, we have Dr. Richard Weikart to help us uh, seek uh, the answer to this question. Well, it says, 
beliefs on this matter. And uh, Dr. Weikart is the author of Hitler's Religion, The Twisted Beliefs That Drove the Third Reich. And we will be sure to put a, a link to this on our website uh, so you can check that out. Um, all right, Richard. So I want to um, now with the rest of the program go through here these different options sort of people have. So um, first, let's start with this question. Was Hitler a Christian? Okay, you, you, we've already talked about this a little bit about the different yeah. definitions, but I mean, Hitler, by his own, by his own understanding of Christianity, uh, he rejected Christianity in private many, many times. In his monologues, uh, he called Hitler the most insane thing that a human brain had ever devised at one point. He scoffed at Christian doctrines like the virgin birth, the resurrection. Uh, it's pretty basic Christian uh, doctrines. Uh, so. Uh, he he himself did not see himself as being a Christian. And in fact, one time when he was in uh, Landsberg prison after his beer hall putsch, uh, Rudolf Hess, his right-hand man, was holding a discussion with some other guys there about religion, and Hitler stayed aloof out of the discussion. After it was over, though, Hess and Hitler talked privately, and Hitler told Hess, point blank, that he had to play the religious hypocrite. That's the, He even used that term himself, that he had to be a religious hypocrite for political reasons. Mm. Uh, and so... Uh, he was, when he made statements like in April 1922, there's a famous speech that he gave, it's famous now because the atheists play on it, where he called Jesus his Lord and Savior. It was purely a political ploy. And it, it, what's interesting, too, if you look at the times when he said those things, he was usually responding to some other politician who had, who had called him out on his religious, his anti-religious views. And Hitler was basically saying, no, no, I really, <laughs> I really am a, a Christian. So... Uh, but one of the most interesting things I discovered as I was doing this uh, book, and I have the pictures of photos of this in the book, was in 1932, so the year before Hitler became chancellor, when he was still having to pander to the Germans' uh, political sensibilities a little bit more, yeah. uh, his personal photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, did a photo of him coming out of a church in northern Germany, and there's this white cross right above Hitler's head, sort of like you know, a halo effect, and the <laughs> caption... And the caption to the photo says, uh, Hitler the, uh, no, it says, a chance event becomes a symbol. Hitler the supposed heretic coming out of the Marina Kirche in Wilhelmshaven. And so the, the takeaway of that is supposed to be, look, Hitler's coming out of a church. You assume maybe he's going to church service. And uh, he has this cross above his head. So it's, you know, sort of a sign that he's, you know, really not a heretic. He's really a Christian. However, what I discovered in researching my book was that five or six years later, uh, in a new edition of that same book that had that photo in it, Heinrich Hoffmann and Hitler had the cross airbrushed out of the photo. Is that so right? That no, yes. So it was no longer, there was no cross in it anymore. And of course, they had to change the caption because of that too. So the new caption, and, and this is by 1938, by the time Hitler was entrenched in power, you didn't have to worry quite as much about his popularity in, in these ways. The new caption said, Hitler after sightseeing in the historic Marina Kirche. So <laughs> making clear that he hadn't gone to a church service. You know, he was just sight, just looking at the architecture. Yeah. Uh, there. Uh, so Hitler at that point was distancing himself more from Christianity. And what, what, if you look at Hitler's pronouncements before 1933 and after 1933, you'll find that after 1933, he hardly ever identified, even publicly, mm. uh, with Christianity. Uh, and certainly never called Jesus his Lord and Savior yeah. uh, after 1933. And then if you look at his private conversations that he had, Goebbels kept diaries during the time. Rosenberg kept diaries that we have access to today. Uh, Hitler's secretary wrote memoirs. Uh, and then we have his monologues during World War II. And all of those, Hitler made very uh, strong anti-Christian statements, uh, ridiculing the churches. Uh, and such. And so it's pretty clear that Hitler was not a Christian. Also, I, I also have a chapter in my book talking about how Hitler persecuted the churches in various kinds of ways, too. He didn't come out and try to totally disband the churches in 1933. He knew that wouldn't go over with the German public. So he's playing to the German public still to some degree, but he tried to whittle away at their influence wherever he could. Mm. That was going to be my follow up. Uh, <clears throat> for those that are familiar, say, with Dietrich Bonhoeffer's story, um, we learn about Hitler's persecution of the church. And he didn't like that some people were saying uh, that pastors or priests were saying, th you know, bad things or, or critical things about him. Uh, so what were some of the things that he did to uh, push down um, 
evangelical views on him? Well, uh, there's some very in- once he got into World War II, there's some very interesting things that happened. Uh, again, he he sort of went, moved slowly. He didn't try to come out and just sort of squash the churches completely. In fact, he even warned uh, sometimes his colleagues. There were some SS leaders uh, who Hitler sometimes told to back off of their anti-Christian activities. And again, it was not because he disagreed with uh, their anti-religion. It was because he said it's not politically wise to do that. will alienate too many people and such. And so those were the kind of things that went on. Uh, during World War II, he assigned the chaplains to the forward up in the front as far as, for, uh, as far front as possible to try to get them all killed off. This was actually referred to at the time by people, uh, Hitler didn't call it this, but other people referred to this as the Uriah order. Yeah. After yeah. after Hit, after uh, King David's, David put Uriah, Uriah yeah, out at the front lines. The of the battle. So Hitler tried to get the chaplains killed off uh, if he could in, in battle. Hitler also drew up plans for the German cities to rebuild them after World War II. No churches in those uh, plans, the architectural wow. plans that were drawn up for the the new cities. During the war, uh, they would uh, they put uh, uh, paper restrictions. They called. They said this was rationing for the war effort. But of course, uh, so peri- church periodicals got shut down during the war, uh, and they did a lot of different things to try to, to cut down on church influence wherever they could. Hitler Youth became mandatory mm. during the late 1930s, and because of that, they shut down all of the church youth organizations. Both the Protestant and Catholic Church had very thriving youth organizations before the Nazi period. They all got shut down, and all the youth had to join the Hitler Youth. Wow. Uh, and there was a lot of anti-religious propaganda in the Hitler Youth also, so there's just all sorts of ways that Hitler was trying to undermine the influence of the churches, especially with the young people, again, especially mm-hmm. in the schools and especially in the Hitler youth. You really see um, you know, propaganda play out where the government is manipulating uh, the, uh, the, the, even the history, you know, like what they airbrushed the cross out of the, <laughs> the church, yeah. the church picture. Um, and some people are, are worried they, they might draw connections, you know, to... Um, American presidents, you know, people have been doing it for decades now. Oh, so and so, well, that's what Hitler did, you know. And and the comparisons, I mean, they're so weak uh, when you look at what exactly Hitler did uh, to paint himself to be, you know, uh, a better person uh, or to veer people's thoughts in a certain direction. Um, all right, so let's move along here to the the second issue. Okay, so Hitler wasn't a Christian. Um, was he an atheist? No, this is a little trickier because in part it's going to depend on how you define atheism. And some people say that pantheism is atheism. I've run into people that when I argue that Hitler was pantheism, they say, no, he was an and, – and they'll say, well, that means he is an atheist uh, because if you believe that nature is God, then, you know, uh, that is uh, an atheistic view. I don't think that's quite true. Uh, Hitler – does have some belief in, he uses the word providence an awful lot, not just in public, but also in private. Uh, Hitler never uh, said that he was an atheist or said that he believed there was no kind of God. Uh, He did deny uh, a personal afterlife. Uh, He did claim that once we die, we simply get reabsorbed back into the reservoir of nature, which is, again, why I think he's a pantheist. He sees everything sort of going back to nature Mm. and such. Uh, but he does have this notion that nature can intervene in certain ways too. He, when he gets, uh, when he uh, has uh, survives assassination attempts and such, he he assigns this to providence. And again, I don't think this was just a political ploy. I think he really did think that way that providence was behind it. And in fact, I actually argue that because he had some belief in some kind of active providence uh, in this panthe in his pantheistic God. He, I think this is one of the things that gave him hope that he was going to win World War II, even when it was obviously <laughs> lost, and when he should have known better. Uh, I mean, to the very end, I mean, uh, again, uh, obvi- not quite to the very end, because he does commit suicide uh, before uh, his country surrenders, and he tells uh, his, his successors to go ahead and keep waging the war uh, when it's all done, but... Uh, when everyone else realized the war was up, Hitler was still confident that somehow God was going to save him. Somehow God was going to intervene. And he'd seen this happen before. He'd lost at the Beer Hall Putsch, and somehow he'd come out on top after that. You know, there'd been other episodes where he had, you know, survived assassination attempts and other kinds of things. So he somehow, he had this confidence that somehow God was going to save him uh, in World War II that I think stuck with him and that uh, that, that was not complete atheism. However, 
if we do look at uh, Hitler does uh, actually speak quite positively of some atheists, and he does sort of associate himself with some atheists. He thought very highly of Nietzsche. There's a, a photo of him across from Nietzsche in the Nietzsche archives. He gave money to the Nietzsche archives. Nietzsche, mm. of course, was saying God is dead. Uh, he thought very highly of uh, Frederick the Great, uh, his religious ideas, which Frederick the Great was uh, a religious skeptic, uh, certainly, and Hitler uh, certainly uh, lauds religious skepticism at various times. But again, when it comes down to what he really believed, it does seem that pantheism is sort of the best uh, and, and closest thing, if he actually had a consistent metaphysic. And by the way, that's also a possibility. It's possible he didn't have a consistent metaphysic, yeah. in which case uh, he may not have been a consistent pantheist. But I think his pantheism comes closest to where he usually ends up. So why is it that uh, some people f float the idea that he was in the occult? I think that's largely because there were other in his entourage who were into the occult. So there's lots of, you know, you, if you go to the History Channel, you see all sorts of shows about the Nazism and the occult. And there was a lot of occult elements uh, that were integrated into Nazism, especially the SS, because Himmler was very interested in the occult and, uh, and neo-paganism and, and such. Uh, Hess, who I mentioned earlier is Hitler's uh, personal secretary and such, Hess was all very interested in astrology and the occult. There's mm -hmm. an interesting story, though, about Hess, and this sort of brings in Hitler's anti-occultist side. When Hess fled to uh, England, uh, bailed out over Scotland in May 1941 to try to broker a deal with the British, uh, Hitler thought he'd gone insane, and Hitler blamed the occultists and blamed the huh. astrologers for sort of putting Hess up to that. And so a couple weeks later, Hitler ordered the SS and his police forces to round up astro leading astrologers and occultists throughout Germany because Hitler uh, was mad at them for having, you know, sort of, he thought, put Hess up to this. So they rounded up all these astrologers, put them in the concentration camps and prisons in Germany, again, signifying Hitler's anti-occultist bent. But there's a, a very interesting twist to this story, too, because Himmler was interested in the occult. Himmler actually took one of those astrologers and took him out of custody, a guy named Wilhelm Wolf, took him out of custody and made him his personal astrologer. So Hitler and Himmler were not of the same mind about this particular issue. So some of the Nazis, like Hitler and Goebbels and Heydrich, were very anti-occultist, but others like Himmler and Hess, and there were others as well, uh, Rosenberg, also were into more occult and neo-pagan kind of uh, things. Mm, interesting. I never knew that. I was always curious why people associated the occult, but it, it, his, his associates were into that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, all right. Do you think the uh, continued debate surrounding Hitler's religion will sort of um, officially be laid to rest? Um, it seems like it just keeps you know, going on and on. W what would it take for people to finally realize, um, you know, hey, he wasn't a Christian, he wasn't an atheist, that's the end of the story? Well, I'm hoping my book, Hitler's Religion, will help lay it to rest to some degree. <laughs> I don't think it's going to necessarily succeed. But interestingly, uh, the reviews that have come out, there was actually a review in Humanist.com that was very positive toward it, which kind of surprised me because I thought the atheists were going to kind of jump on me you know, with it and say, no, 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 Hitler really was a Christian. Yeah. And such. But actually, this one review, and I think some of the atheists will just dismiss my ideas sure. probably. Uh, but uh, Humanist.com actually gave me a pretty positive review of my uh, uh, book yeah. uh, and such. And, and possibly that's also because I'm arguing Hitler wasn't an atheist, too. So, that, right. you know, that sort of fits into their way, too. So I'm hoping that my book will help shed light on this issue in a way that maybe can uh, help us get over the the misconceptions that are out there. I'm not totally convinced that's going to happen. I mean, there's there's really bizarre things that get brought up sometimes on atheist websites and such, it's trying to prove that the Nazis were Christians. And one of the most bizarre ones, I think, that just got brought up to me yesterday when I was talking with someone was the thing about the belt buckles having Gott mit uns on them. The German army had belt buckles that said Gott mit uns. Uh, however, those belt buckles with Gott mit uns were... Uh, were initiated in the German military well before the Nazi period. It wasn't Hitler didn't introduce those mm. into the Nazi period. It's just one of those things he tolerated because the military already had it and he wasn't wanting to antagonize them, yeah. you know, by telling me you got to get rid of those or something. Uh, so uh, Hitler didn't uh, make them get rid of it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Hitler was approving of uh, 
the Gott mit uns. And also, you could interpret Gott to be whatever you wanted in that context, too. It doesn't have to be the Christian Gott uh, at that point. Right. In fact, when, when Himmler, Himmler in the mid-1930s, did withdraw from the Catholic Church, Himmler had also been raised Catholic, and Hitler at first, when he came to power, told his associates not to withdraw, but by the mid-1930s, Hitler actually did allow them to withdraw from the Catholic Church. And so when Himmler withdrew from the Catholic Church, he and many other SS leaders and members, instead of uh, identifying themselves as religionless, registered as God believers. And what <laughs> Gläubige was the German term. Interesting. So, so believers in God, but just a vague, it could be any kind of God. It was just some vague God. But, but they withdrew from the Catholic Church. Uh, or in some cases, SS leader, maybe the Protestant church as well, but they call themselves in Gott Gläubig. So, so, again, Hitler believed in God of some sort, so Gott mit uns, his pantheistic God, could be the Gott mit uns too. Yeah, right. Uh, Anthony writes here, I love the themes Richard Weikart is hitting on, sort of following in Rodney Stark's footsteps by clearing up some of these attempts to revise history. So, Anthony, thank you for that comment and for watching along today. Um, Richard, you've had the uh, awesome opportunity um, to be interviewed by C-SPAN. And so um, tomorrow, uh, broadcast at 7.42 Central Time on C-SPAN 2, uh, you're going to be um, interviewed on uh, the death of humanity and the case for life, and then, of course, Hitler's religion. So w how did that come about? How did you get that, uh, that great opportunity? Well, they were uh, C-SPAN was doing interviews with book uh, authors at uh, a conference I went to called Freedom Fest in Las Vegas uh, in July, and so they contacted me and asked me if they could uh, interview me about my books, and I said sure. So they interviewed me about both uh, Hitler's religion as well as the death of humanity. It's about a fifteen to twenty minute interview that they did with me, and so it's going to be showing uh, then tomorrow on C-SPAN. I think they said they're going to run it a couple of other. Uh, weekends later on too. So if you miss it tomorrow, may show later, and they may put it on their website eventually too. I think they do put most of them on their website. I think I'm not positive of that, but I'm guessing it'll be on their website later on too. Yeah, we'll be sure to keep a lookout for it. And if they do put it up online and it's embeddable, then we'll put it up on our website too. And uh, for those that want to even uh, read more, uh, Apologetics 315 is coming out with an, uh, a review of Dr. Weikar's book that's going to be published. Um, the review will be published next week at that website, apologetics315.com. So glad to be partnering uh, and, and utilizing that ministry to help uh, spread the, the great work that you've done here, Dr. Weikart. And thank you so much for coming on our program today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. We'll be sure to bring you on again to talk about the death of humanity. So I'll be in touch in the coming weeks here. Great. We're looking forward to it. God bless you. Okay, you too. All right. Well, that does it for our program today. Um, I, again, want to encourage uh, you, if you haven't yet gone to our uh, conference website, thedefendersconference.com, please consider coming to Chicago uh, September 28 and 29. It's going to be a wonderful event um, where we're going to hear from um, a number of different uh, evangelical perspectives on the supposed genocide commands. And those uh, keynote speakers are Dr. John Walton, Dr. Paul Copan, Dr. Kenton Sparks, and uh, Dr. Clay Jones. And uh, at the end of the conference, there will be a roundtable discussion. And that's going to be really fascinating to hear these perspectives engage with each other and to see, hey, what are some of the, the pros and cons? What are the strengths and weaknesses to, say, your interpretation or your interpretation? Um, and uh, it really will provide an opportunity for Christians to... Um, maybe have their own views challenged as well uh, to think critically about how we uh, understand the Israelites um, conveying to us that God commanded them to do these things and dealing with those issues. And of course, during the breakout sessions, there will be other topics as well. Uh, so if you go to the website, you can learn more about that, thedefendersconference.com, and you can register there too. Uh, I want to give folks just a heads up that uh, Chris and I have been busy working on a fundraising video for Apologetics 315, so keep a lookout for that. Uh, hopefully coming this week, uh, and we've just got a few more final edits. Um, so if you want to uh, become a patron of our program, uh, go to our website, veracityhill.com slash patron, and please leave a review for us on iTunes and the Google Play Store or wherever you're listening, Facebook, uh, we would love to get more reviews. That's going to help with the, the search results. Uh, so please leave us those five-star reviews. Uh, 
All right, so that does it for the program today. I'm grateful for the continued support of our patrons and the partnerships that we have with our sponsors. And those sponsors are Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, the Illinois Family Institute, Fox Restoration, and Nonprofit Megaphone. I want to thank our technical producer, Chris, and to our guest today, Dr. Richard Weichart. Uh, and last but not least, I want to thank you for listening in and for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.